Coming up on Theater Talk. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. Well, you've heard it here first. The best new musical of the season is the Scottsboro Boys, off-Broadway at the Vineyard Theater, but I have a hunch it's not going to be there for long. This show is on the move. It has a brilliant score by one of the great composers of the American Musical Theater, John Kander. Welcome back to Theater Talk. Thank you. <laughs> Fabulous lyrics by your great friend Fred Ebb, who sadly is no longer with us, whom we miss, but uh, he is back to life. In He's, this with, show. Us <laughs> He's with us all the time. He's with us all the time. Uh, it is brilliantly directed by Susan Stroman, who, of course, did The Producers and Young Frankenstein and Steel Pier for Candor and Ed. And I believe sort of your breakthrough was The World Goes Round with Candor The World Ed. Goes Round and actually Floor the Red Menace down All at the right. Vineyard Theater. So, so we are back. That's how we got started at the Vineyard Theater with the revival of Floor the Red Menace. So you've been in the Candor and Ebb camp for a long time. I have. Yes, we've become best friends. So <laughs> we're together that's again. Well, well, welcome back to that Theater. Thank back. you. Uh, the show features a terrific cast, and we are very pleased to have two of those cast members with us. Two guys are going to be stars by the time the show opens. <laughs> Coleman Domingo, who was wonderful in Passing Strange and Well, and who had a one-man show of his own, A Boy and His Soul, at the Vineyard last season. Oh, boy, right. Right. Welcome yes, to yeah. Theater Talk. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> and the terrific Brandon Victor Dixon, who was in The Color Purple, The Lion King, and House of Flowers. And congratulations on the Scottsboro Boys. Thank you very much. Welcome all. Um, all right, John, the Scottsboro Boys is, of course, about the famous 1931 yes. case, 31. I believe, where uh, nine black men were uh, wrongly convicted of raping two white w women and spent many, many years in jail. Um, what got you and Fred thinking about turning this civil rights event into a, into a musical? Well, it uh, started really because uh, Stroh and Fred and I and Tommy Thompson. Your book writer. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, wanted to work together. We, uh, our little family had been together for a long time and still is. And we began talking about subjects and we were looking for something which had, I don't, not necessarily political, but something which had a real moment in time that, that mattered. Mm -hmm. And we played around with several subjects, didn't we? Yes, but we, uh, the idea of a, a real trial, something <clears throat> in American history that mattered. And, and what's interesting is because of Florida and Menace and Steel Pier, that in the 30s, that world, we actually, in our research for those shows, came across the Scottsboro Boys just because of the communism, uh, the communist mm -hmm. ideas in Floor the Red Menace mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and just the depression uh, in, in Steel Pier. So when we were looking for cases or looking through ideas, that came up and we were all familiar with it. So uh, we researched it some more and it was just rich mm -hmm. with uh, material. And you know, for, for Kander and Neb, you know, they take ordinary people in extraordinary situations, and that's what they write about, and they write about for the underdog. So the idea of taking these nine boys, humanizing these nine boys, um, uh, what seemed like the perfect idea mm -hmm. to write about. Actually, because when researching them, they're always called the Scottsboro Boys, just the Scottsboro Boys. That's and, true. Yeah. They're not individualized in any way. As and, they it are. Was, yeah. and it was uh, the idea of trying to make them individuals when we would write about them. So we start, once we um, started on that idea, it just went. Mm -hmm. It just went. It seemed like a perfect for Cantor Neb, actually. Brandon, the character you're playing is named? Haywood Patterson. And he is kind of the, I guess, the sort of the lead, right, in the, in the lead Scottsboro boy here. I mean, yeah, he kind of, uh, I mean, within the group of boys, I think he's the one that's always the most outspoken, and mm -hmm. so he tends to, I, tends to pull a lot of the, the, the pull the boys along, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. um, and he kind of maintains the, uh, for me, with the show, and I, especially when I read it, he maintains the, 
I guess the the personal integrity of the boys, and he maintains that uh, the, the the truth of how they feel about the circumstances they've been put in and um, and the situations they have to deal with. Now, obviously, I mean that was how I originally thought of it when I read the book uh, initially. But the other boys have been expanded; um, they have become much more individuals in this show as well um, since the first. The Your first character was the one who who wrote. He learned to write in prison, and then yes. he wrote letters which were well known. He escaped. He skipped twice. He he fought the case. He remained in jail one way or the other for. He most was the longest in jail. He died. Yeah. He died in jail for yeah. 22 yeah. years. <laughs> because they offered him, say you're guilty and you'll get paroled, and he wouldn't admit the guilt. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Now an interesting choice that you've made. This takes place in the, in Scot in Scottsboro, mm -hmm. Alabama, mm -hmm. and uh, the entire white community is played by African American actors. So you made this very interesting choice to have. John, uh, the great John Cullum as the w one actual white person in the show, mm -hmm. and then the entire white racist world who are, are, are oppressing these people, mm -hmm. played with a very interesting interpretation. Where did that choice come from? Well, that actually stems from the using the device of a minstrel show. Right. And once we talked about the Scottsboro Boys, it was how to now um, make that into a musical. And um, the thought came up about really almost starting with sort of the architecture of a minstrel show, of the semicircle and, and playing the characters. And, and in a sense, when we started to speak about it, wouldn't it be great if those nine boys could overtake a minstrel show? Mm -hmm. and, and something that was thought of, a minstrel show is very racist, and the Scottsboro Boys Boy case, a racist case, that they would come together and let the boys now tell their story as mm -hmm. if this is the only way to tell their story. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Just seemed to, uh, we, we got on a roll with that. The and interesting thing I think is that once, once we decided, <coughs> excuse me, on the Mr. Show form. Framework, yeah. It, uh, I mean, it sounds dumb to say it, but it almost wrote itself. I mean, we did lots and lots of versions of it, but that allowed us to do anything we wanted. Yeah. If, you want, if you want to be in one place, one second, or another place, another second. You don't have to justify it in any mm -hmm. other way except to say, now we're going to tell this story, or now we're going to sing this song. Well, to, oh. me, it's, it's <laughs> classic, to me, it's classic Candor and Ed, though. You take a serious subject matter, cabaret, for example, <clears throat> anti-Semitism, the rise of Nazi Germany, and you set it in an entertainment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a cabaret. Absolutely. You take Chicago, corrupt justice system, and you set it as a kind of uh, vaudeville type yeah. of show. Yeah. And here, it's a minstrel show. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that one thing they said in the beginning of rehearsals is the idea of how to make it also entertaining. How can, how can people make it, people listen, you know what I mean, as well, be entertained, but also, you know, really take in this information. And I think it's a very, it's a brilliant structure. And I think something about also by playing all the, I played the most horrific. You play all the bad guys. All bigots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 myself and Forrest. We, 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 we play the bad guys. Well, I play most of the <laughs> Yeah, I beat most of the entire show. Uh, but, 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 and, and, sheriff. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I really believe that, um, I've had so many uh, friends say, wow, it, it really, it's so strong because it is, we are in control of telling this story. If, it, if, if there were white actors playing those roles as the sheriff and, mm -hmm. you know, the big lawyers and everything, it would be such yeah. a different story. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, but it really is in control of the boys and the end men, you know, helping to tell the story. And we should say, you, you play them, you're, you're kind of spoofing. I mean, you can't yeah. spoof yeah. this story. Right. In, 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 but well, you're a comic I, I, I'm presence. a comic, a comic presence. So you get know, myself and Forrest, we come back on, I think especially when things get a little, Really, get, when you get to the heart of things, we'll also remember we're in the vaudeville, mm -hmm. and we have to keep moving the story along. Yeah. And also believe that you know, we are. I think uh, Forrest and I, we make some um, some some broader choices. I think mm -hmm. to, to to help these characters, so it uh, really this the boy story resonates yeah. even more so. You make yeah. a good point. It might yeah. be too horrifying. I, I said to my mother, who's in her 80s and grew up during the Scottsboro Boys, I said, "Well, I'm going to a musical of the Scottsboro Boys." She said, "A musical of the Scottsboro Boys." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, that, that yeah. it would be too horrifying <laughs> if it was white yes. people. I think, yeah. Well, I think it's yeah. also. I mean. Uh, I think the fact that it is is played by you know Coleman and Forrest mm -hmm. and that they're African American actors, I think it also it, it heightens the, the the theatrical nature of it, and yeah. also um, being able to balance really going for it with the jokes and with the writing and really you know playing up the characters. Yeah. When you when you heighten the 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 humor and the yeah. uh, the humor with the drama, and when you set it in this framework, I think it also becomes that's what's so brilliant about it to me. It becomes very clear that 
this this is a setting in which these people actually had to make these things funny. They had to do this. Yeah. You know, this is something that is forced upon them. So you get you get both sides. You get yeah. you get the the realism of the drama that the boys go through, but you also get the. Uh, I think eventually you realize well, yeah, yeah, the, you absurdity the absurdity of the fact that a lot of, of these lines that are taken, that, you know, these Vegas, these are these are old the, minstrel show yeah, routines. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. But also do. some of these lines that, that I say, you know, I have this song called "Financial Advice," and there's some lyrics in there that actually come from, you know, things that this lawyer would actually say in court in this trial. Such yeah. 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 as you know, I would sniff around and smell the air and and say, "I smell money." Yeah, you know, and, you know I you know I smell the North, and that was actually said in the trial. This, yeah, this legal witch actually yeah. said this yeah. is an absurd way for a DA to for a, the, uh, the a prosecutor general, to, exactly, to act. Yeah. She was in court. We, we should just say that the yeah. attorney for the Scottsboro Boys was um, a famous uh, 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 le lawyer, Samuel Leibowitz. Samuel Leibowitz, a yes. Jewish lawyer who came down, yeah. and he comes to the South, and the first thing the prosecutor does with, is say yeah. he's a Jew. Look at these yeah. the Southern people. He's no, he came up against the same prejudice. You know, he and he couldn't believe it. I think he. From New York, he went down and they were thought he's going to take these nine boys back. He's going to yeah. save the Scottsboro mm -hmm. boys. And he got there and he couldn't believe the prejudice that came against being from the North and, of course, being Jewish. When you and Fred were working on the score, um, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, didn't, did, do you guys do a lot of historical research, don't you, when no. you were writing in the stock? You give me some of the things you looked at and the, the type of music that you're evoking in this. Well, early on, uh, I opted for a kind of ragtime feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, Throughout the score, uh, I, I'm old enough so that I do remember all of this. And I, when the, when the Scottsboro Boys were in the newspapers, I was eight, ten years old, mm -hmm. and uh, they were always there as a group. Mm -hmm. you, you never knew anybody's name. You just saw mm -hmm. the Scottsboro Boys did this, the Scottsboro Boys did that, and they were a sort of force. And people for a long time were kind of afraid of them. Mm -hmm. And then people stopped being afraid of them and stopped being interested. But yeah. weren't they allied in the public mind with communism at the, at well, the time? There was a whole national thing. There were, the, uh, communists the communists went down involved. to help them. Yeah. Yeah. But lots, lots and lots of people contributed to Joe Stein, as a matter of fact, who's coming on uh, Tuesday night. Yeah. Joe he, Stein, who wrote Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> he gave 25 bucks to him, so I'm going to give him his 25 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> But going back, so they, they, there was a ragtime style of music. Yeah, and un, un, underneath it all, it's at a time it, we certainly hadn't gotten to swing. Yeah, yet. and jazz itself, the kind of jazz that m Middle America or Southern Middle America would be listening to, would still be a, a kind of jazz which was influenced by ragtime, by a kind of squareness, mm. and. So I just thought about that and listen. I've done this on a number of shows. You listen to it and then you forget about it, mm -hmm. and then you hope that the influence of what you listen to mm -hmm. comes, comes through up through you your mean. butt and into your head. And <laughs> <laughs> but he's almost like a musical way. archivist, though, with all the shows. Yeah. I always feel that you know you really have plunged into the sound. Yes, that's the true. sound of that era, and that's what's captured. Yeah. Um, what is I find fascinating about the use of the minstrel show is mm -hmm. that. You pull no punches in staging the minstrel show. I mean, this, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel that you have really gone back and studied the minstrel shows, and this is the way it was presented, well, and yes, we're going to do it that way. Well, absolutely, and they did, you know, in, in the middle of a minstrel show, they would tell a story. They would tell a short story. They yeah. wouldn't tell the Scottsboro Boys, <laughs> <No>. but, <laughs> but uh, it absolutely makes sense to do this in that way, and, and, and to have the two end men and to have the interlocutor who plays sort of the kindly host John of the Cullum. evening, John yeah. Cullum. And the music actually lends itself to the minstrel show, too. But the, the interlocutor would also, also often interrupt a story and say, uh, Mr. Bones, won't you do this? Or, Mr. Tambo, won't you do that? Or uh, Mr. And it was always Mr. Mm -hmm. with each one of the, mm -hmm. the people in the line. Won't you sing us that beautiful ballad? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yes. and, 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 and they would, or, or, or then... Uh, gentlemen, won't you uh, favor us with a, a song about the old South? And so they would all do it. He would tell them in this very semi-genteel way what to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Semi-patriarchal. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yes, no, it's all there. I mean, the yeah. whole kind of history of the South and the um, um, society of the South is mm -hmm. embedded in the minstrel show format. Yeah. What was your reaction, guys, when you were presented with um, 
with a show that was going to be a, a minstrel show. I mean, did you have any like, uh, what, what, what are we doing here? It's funny. I, you know, I was, after I auditioned for, I guess, the first workshop, which was two years ago, um, I was at home, and my brother happened to be home that weekend, and he's a lawyer. And I was sitting there, and because my, my, my manager had called me, she said, okay, just read it now, because Susan really needs to know. <laughs> <laughs> and I opened the document, and the, the title page, it says, you know, the Scottsboro Boys, a minstrel show. And I said, really? <laughs> <laughs> and my brother's like, what's wrong? He's like, it's a minstrel show. And he said, well, I was like, I'm going to read it. It's a workshop. Let's see what's, let's see what's going on. And I, and I read it, and I was really, as I was reading, I was like, Okay, I see it's it's not just arbitrarily a minstrel show. It's yes. being used as a device, yes. but uh, when you see why it's there, yes. that's what matters. Not not what it is, but why it is. What was your reaction, Colin? I, I was approached by Doug Abel. At, he just called me up. And he, um, from the, the head vineyard, of the vineyard. Head of the vineyard theater called me up, and he said, um, hey, they're looking for an actor to, you know, to do this workshop. And... Um, and basically, you know, they, they had the music. And it was at a time when I was saying, you know, this is after Passing Strange. I was like, well, you know, I, I want to get back into, you know, doing plays. I don't really do musicals. That, that's, I, kept, I kept saying that, and then I ended up doing the wigs. And, <laughs> you know, but anyway, so anyway, somehow I keep ending up in musicals. But, so I, I, I listened, I to, the, I listened to the music, and more than, more than anything, I thought, about, I thought about the team involved. I thought about Doug Abel. I thought about Kendra Nepp. I thought, I thought about Susan Stroman. I thought all these minds in one room. And, and then I heard you were involved as well. I'm like, I would like to be in this room. I, and I listened to the music. I, I didn't even read the script. So you I, didn't see Scottsboro Boys, a minstrel show? No, I didn't know anything about being a minstrel. I just listened to the music, and that's what, what guided me. And I said, yeah, I, I'd like to do this. I think if, if they want me, I want them as well. You know, I just felt like, you know, the team seemed right, you know? Susan, the direction is really, really brilliant. And, and you've gone from, you know, having directed these... 10, 15 million dollar musicals, The Producers, Young Frankenstein, big Broadway shows. You've gone back off Broadway and you're <laughs> using just tambourines and chairs. I know. Is it a deliberate choice on your part to go back to a simpler show and a simpler no, staging? No, I mean, I have, uh, I've had taken some smaller steps, you yeah. know, with yeah. contact was small and happiness yeah. was small and, you know, um, but, but no, it just was appropriate for this show to do it this way. Mm -hmm. it, it just, um, because it's it's scaled down and it's just about the chairs and the tambourines, it's really um, all about the boys and there's nothing else in the way and nothing gets in the way. Mm -hmm. And it's not only do they are they allowed to tell their story, they're allowed to build a set. Yes, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, you yeah. know, so they can take that set anywhere they want to go and make it into anything. It becomes a boxcar. It becomes a, 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 a jury room. Yes, and a courtyard, prison. A prison. And it's, it, it allows them to be in charge of the whole show. And that, that was what we wanted. That's uh, why the device works so well. And the idea, too, of all of the fellas getting to play all the parts. They play the women. They play um, the sheriff. They play the, um, the preacher, boy. the little yeah. white boys. They, they play. Get to, it's sort of an acting tour de force for them. Yeah. I want to ask you, John, um, Fred's been dead how many years now? He died 2004 out. he died. 2004. Six, so it doesn't seem possible. Six years. Um, have you found someone else to write with? Is it possible for you to write with uh, a another lyricist? Well, in, in this show, uh, I, uh, the, the new songs that are in it, I wrote myself. So yes, I know you write. Yeah, you write. Yeah. You channeled just, uh, just ch I would look up and say, where are you, son of a bitch? <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then it would come. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then down it would come. Down it would come. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to, got it. You have, you, now that you're uh, writing lyrics, do you have a uh, sort of a deeper appreciation for the, the, the torture that Fred would go through to write lyrics? Well, is it a hard is, thing to do? The fact <laughs> is that what I, I miss something else, it's, which is our... Uh, being together and, and writing because the fact is when Freddie and I wrote together 90 percent of what we wrote we wrote in the same room at the same time and Fred would improvise and I would improvise and it was uh, and he would duck into my territory and I into his and so we were I would, I'm used to that kind of collaboration mm -hmm. and the reason I swear at him is that <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I'm working is because he's not there yeah, yeah. and uh, didn't you work at his? Didn't you work at, over at his kitchen? Wouldn't you go over to his apartment? And work yeah, at the we, kitchen? Uh, it was his kitchen table. The kitchen table. Yeah, that's where this all started. And in fact, when Fred died, the l song he was writing, or the last song he wrote, was "Nothing" from the Scottsboro Boys, which is Brandon's first song in the show. No, oh, that was the last song Fred wrote. Yeah, nothing. that's when he oh. passed. Huh. Most things happened around that kitchen table. Uh, <laughs> really, truly, I, th I think. Um, 
most of what we wrote began with talks around this this kitchen table and and, and uh, all all of our family know know about that where's Part the table I have now moved to my house oh you've got, <laughs> you've got you've got to know you've got to know in theory and now we all moved to my kitchen part table. of the reason that we all worked around that kitchen table was because fred didn't want to go out yeah that's true. <laughs> right, yeah that's true that's true will you write with uh, would you write with another lyricist if somebody came to you with an idea i don't know uh in curtains uh there are five new songs in it and rupert holmes and i Collaborated on the lyrics for two of those, I think. Mm -hmm. Three of it. I don't know. No. Uh, I would. What do you think? You know him well, Susan. You I think he can do it all. I absolutely. You know, I I think the, the lyrics that he has written for the Scott Spoil Boys are amazing. I think he can do it all. Mm. You hear that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How many actors did you see to, to oh, cast? Oh, jeez, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, Quite a few. Well, make us feel it's special. Come on, How many did you see? Millions. No, I probably it's probably about about. The two fact hundred. of should I tell the truth. This story is about the truth. <laughs> 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 tell the truth. Tell the first, truth. Tell the, tell the, the truth. first day of auditions for this for the very first workshop, you came in and. In our minds, we hired you that night. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to see why now because uh, Mr. Yeah. Dixon, <laughs> Mr. Dixon, would you? How does it go? Favor us. Flavor us. Flavor, Flavor us, us with a song. song. I shall. And the song, uh, a new, I like to say, Candor and Ebb song, is yes. called Go, go back, back Home. Go Back Home. And go just give home. us, in the context of the show, what is going on when he sings this song? Um, at this point, the boys are in the holding cell or in, in the jail, and um, it, I mean. The uh, I guess the, the the real danger that they that they're all in is really hitting home at this point. And uh, one of the boys is reading a letter to his mother, and then the song begins. Lying all alone, I'm thinking, staring at the stars. I wonder since I've been away I'm lonely when I'm gonna go back home Walking through the world Things happen right before your eyes Things happen soon enough you're lost and thinking when I'm gonna go back home. Oh, me, oh, my time goes slow. Where's it gone to? I don't know, but maybe time. Someone's gonna say, All right, son, take the train and go back home. Hop a freight and go back home. Sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm still on a moving freight train. Nothing's standing still, everything just. Looking up at the face of that lazy moon and wondering what's ahead for me. Someday I'll 
beautiful. That, John, that's a really beautiful, beautiful song. Just a beautiful song. Uh, the show is the Scottsboro Boys at the Vineyard Theater. I want to thank uh, Brandon Victor Dixon. I uh, was accompanied at the piano by Paul Massey and Greg Utzig on the guitar. Uh, Coleman Domingo was also in the show. Thank you. Directed by the great Susan Stroman. Thank you very much. John Kander, a legend, really. It's a beautiful, beautiful score. And Fred Ebb, wherever you are. Thanks you a lot. You hear that? <laughs> <laughs> Good night from Theater Talk. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>